guys. This is Doug. Welcome back to What's the Hazard. It is Friday, uh, March 24th, it appears. My guest today is Keith Sampson, and uh, we've not met before, man. We just oh, met in the time. lobby this morning. You're a visitor to Nebraska. You're up here. I am. Visiting and uh, meeting with some other safety folks, and you are the founder, the owner-founder of SRP, um, Environmental Safety, Industrial Hygiene. Yes, that's out correct, of, yeah. Out of Shreveport, Louisiana. Yeah, started in Shreveport. Yeah, you don't sound like you're from Shreveport. No, I'm originally from Canada. <laughs> that is so interesting As to we me. We were talking this morning, you know, my, my family always thinks I'm, I'm very Southern. You've got this uh, real Southern drawl now. Yeah, and then then they hear some of my employees, and they're like, okay, he doesn't sound Southern. Yeah, well, you sound Southern. <laughs> they sound like they're from another planet is, what, is what's <laughs> yeah. actually going on there. Well, thank you for joining me, oh, man. My, my pleasure. We have some mutual friends in town here. Um, yeah. You've actually just acquired Schneider's business, Safety right. Solutions. Yeah, Safety Solutions, awesome very good. company. And, uh going very well good man i'm so glad to hear that i know some of uh doug's guys and uh like them very much and they've been really busy around here the last few years so yeah, they, that's they, they stay very busy you know, stay there's, very there's a busy. lot of a lot of work apparently going on here in, in omaha and uh, yes we are really yeah the the construction guys in particular have been really thriving i have a number of friends that are owners of you know small contracting operations that are now large contracting operations and they're building really big houses. Yep. All of these data centers and things yeah, have really lots fed of a lot of people. And apparently, a lot of uh, online, you know, Google and yeah. Facebook. And yeah, those people are. And I don't know much about tax advantages. Obviously, I live in Nebraska, so I'm not. You know, well, somebody, somebody's offering. But some somebody really good is doing ones, yeah. something. It's really <laughs> impressive. So, well, thanks again for joining me, man. Um, I think we are kindred spirits. You're kind of a pump hanger from way back, an industrial hygienist, environmental. Uh, well, toxicology yeah, yeah. How, did, how did you how did you come to this line of work um so i in and i started uh srp in 1996 and uh, we started out mainly as an environmental mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. consulting compliance company uh did a lot of you know remediation soil and groundwater type work mm -hmm. uh, was this no where you started in canada or did you oh, no, start it was, down in, it was in the u.s yeah it was in, it was in louisiana okay. I started it in shreveport okay and um you know, after that, it kind of evolved as, as we added more clients and you get out on these large jobs, you realize, okay, safety is obviously an issue. Mm -hmm, There's mm -hmm. exposure concerns mm -hmm. and you recognize kind of early on that, our, you know, the client base, you, you'd go somewhere and it would be, you know, the, the HR director would be the person in charge of, you know, EHS or of course. You know, wearing multiple hats and <laughs> right. like, help me here. Yeah. Um, so we recognize not only was it, you know, environmental was important to them, but industrial hygiene, uh, safety, even like DOT, there was, there was mm -hmm. a lot of overlap. Absolutely. And, and so we made the decision kind of early on that we kind of have to be more of a one-stop shop just to, you know, if clients need it. Mm -hmm. so. I, I, that's really interesting because, because, because I, um, my business has evolved similarly, but not alike at all. You know, I'm still a one man shop who utilizes a number of subcontractors to fulfill what you've just described. Right. Because I had the same concern, you know, these, these companies would come to you for assistance and they would need a number of different things that were all somewhat related, but not, you know, they were certainly not in my wheelhouse. And so I was, I couldn't address it at all in the beginning. So I thought, well, that's bad. I'm sending them to other consultants. You know, that's not a great model, right. but you, you've had the actual courage to grow your business, whereas I just cowered under a rock most of the I time. I call it courage or just being naive. <laughs> <laughs> it was so, a little of both in yeah. the beginning, probably. I mean, I always tell people, you know, when you, when you look back, you're like, wow, like, you know, you could have come a long way. But I think if you were looking at all the obstacles ahead of time, it would have been pretty daunting. It would have. Yeah, yes. So. so you just put your head down and I, did yeah, it. I had, I had blinders on and just. Yeah, yeah good for you, kept, man. Kept grinding every day and yeah. it, it worked out. Um, That's good. And, you know, we've, we've got a really good team. and you know, as you mentioned earlier, we've, we've grown organically with, a you know, opening a lot of offices. Uh, in fact, our, our, our very second office after Shreveport was Honolulu. I'll bet it was. Yeah, it was <laughs> things it, went it well was, in Shreveport. So yeah. uh, now was that based on a particular client that had a no, need or no, actually, you actually I, um, started looking for business in 2006. So I was, you know, the company was about 10 years old. I went to Hawaii for the first time ever. And, you know, everybody's like, oh, it's beautiful. And it, it obviously it was. I, I mm -hmm. love Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, and I get there and I'm looking around and everything is self-contained. I'm like, 
they have to store everything here. There's tanks everywhere. Yes. They like, they're so isolated. And I'm like, this is, this is a, a, be a great market. And, Absolutely. And, and it has been. I'll bet it has. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's an interesting, but you're right. Everything has to be self-contained or brought over by ship or plane or something. It is really a yeah. unique system. Yep. The ports, uh, yeah, it's, it, they have to do a lot of things there on their own, but there's a lot of storage compared to even here mm -hmm. you know, on the mainland. And, and Louisiana, man, that's like oh, the chemical yeah. capital of the world. Yeah, Baton Rouge, mm -hmm. the, the, that whole corridor. Yeah. Absolutely. So you've had a lot of experience with that. Well, I'm glad you're up here, man. I, um, It's interesting because I've been living and working here in Nebraska for a long time. There is a, a, a tremendous demand and need for good environmental safety and health support. And, you know, I mean, we have some good players here, but it's good to have more. I'm glad that people get what they need. Um, that sounds kind of like weird from a business standpoint, but I think if there's enough work to go around and I think people need good support. I'm, I'm, I want Nebraska to be a safe place to live and work, oh, obviously, absolutely. you know, yeah. so there's, there's more work than, you know, any one entity absolutely. could possibly do. It's just, right. you know, so welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Happy you gonna, to be here. You're gonna have a you're gonna have a home up here somewhere. Ah, I might. <laughs> right. I, I might move in next to Buffett. Oh, that would be nice. <laughs> I hope you do, man. That's what Doug was telling me yesterday. He and Josh were saying, "Yeah, he just lives down the road a few miles." He does. He actually, I, I don't. You know, I've seen Warren in the airport actually a few times. And my wife, we went to some kind of a gathering at one time many years ago uh -huh. that uh, Warren had attended. My wife, of course, went right up to him and started talking to him. I was, you know, you can't <laughs> actually speak to Warren, you know, but. I think he's a guy, you know, like a normal billionaire guy, probably, <laughs> <laughs> if that's a thing, if there is such a thing. They were telling me there's an ice cream shop here in town that Elton John and Warren Buffett, I guess they're friends, they, they go to like a couple of times a year. Really? I'm like, Elton John flies in here to, <laughs> to go to get ice cream. To get ice cream. I'm like, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. And why not? I mean, he's Elton John. He probably do whatever he wants, I suppose, yeah. man. Well, so how did you get into environmental stuff in the first place? Is that your background is? Yeah. Well, so I, my, I was working on a master's degree, um, in environmental planning and management. Okay. Interesting. And, uh, you know, tried to get a, a job with a couple of companies. They turned me down. So like being naive, like I am, I just thought, well, I'll just compete against them. I'll do them myself. <laughs> and I, and, I think that's, and then we've, we've actually, we're way bigger than, than those, those actual companies. But ironically, you know, you talk about, people partnering and there's competition and you know, there's, there's obviously, you know, some people that are good at doing that. And there's others that, you know, they're, they're more like it's a, you know, you're the enemy type thing. Mm -hmm. Um, those companies, we, we work with them all the time and subcontract them mm -hmm. and, and it, it's worked out really well. Good, good. Yeah. And so what's the footprint look like now? I mean, if you've got Hawaii covered and now you're kind of moving, are you primarily through the central corridor, Midwest, Southeast? Um, what's we, the, we, we cover all 50 states. Uh, we've actually done work in Canada and, and Mexico. Nice. Uh, actually did a job in Angola, Africa. Oh, my God. Man. Uh, we were talking about Haswapper earlier. Mm -hmm. yeah, we sent a guy over there to do uh, one of Chevron's contractors, and he was over there for a week. And Did Haswapper training over there? He did Haswapper for him for, yeah, I think it was a week or 10 days. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. I've got a guy for you, man. Well, the guy that does Haswapper for me would probably love to do that. Yeah, so. I, so I used to be, before I was uh, get into this business, I was a teacher. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I've got a science kind of, teacher, science some, teacher, some, chemistry. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, ironically, you know, t I was teaching middle school and then I, you know, five fast forward five years and I'm, I'm teaching adults and it's, it's pretty much the same thing. Like if you, if you don't keep them engaged, they're not going to learn, mm -hmm. but you know, they, it's always interesting because you can tell um, one of the, interesting things like the oil and gas group, you know, they, they like being outdoors. They don't want to be in a classroom. Mm -hmm. but one of the best compliments you can get from a lot of the oil and gas operators, you know, their employees, they walk into class at the end of the day and they go, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And that's, that, that's saying a lot. That is high praise, man. Yeah. You are absolutely right. And, uh, we actually had a client one time that got actually angry with us. He called me up and he's like, we pay you all this money to do this training. And my guys are telling me they played all day. <laughs> I had to get him over there and show him. He's like, Oh, they were learning and they didn't know it. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Which is the best approach you can take with right. those guys. It's, you know, I, I don't think anybody, um, if, you, if you have to sit, you know, through like an asbestos class, which, which I've done, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you have to keep people engaged. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if they're paying attention, 
they're engaged. I, I think they're, they're learning mm -hmm. and, and it's all, that's really what it's about. I mean, we talk about safety, you know, safety is really all about just being aware, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things that we've, we've done at SRP is, you know, we've really pushed, uh, you know, behavior-based safety mm -hmm. and trying to get people to understand, again, using the oil and gas as an example, a lot of people will, you know, look at a hazard or see something and just ignore it. And they're like, that's the safety guy's job. Right. Right. And right. what we try to teach them in class is, is it better to have two eyes looking at everything on the site or, you know, have 50 eyes? Mm -hmm. you know, I was just... I was over at a facility here in Omaha yesterday and they were having a kind of a safety awareness week. And so each day they brought in a different speaker or a different event or something. So I was event number three, apparently on the agenda. And we had that same conversation, you know, in the, when I started safety work back in 1987, which seems like a long time ago, mm -hmm. um, it was, there was a safety, there was a safety program that was administered by a safety person that was over in the corner and if you needed safety stuff done you went over and talked to that guy in the corner otherwise you just did work right and they, the two didn't even like mix you know it was just an add-on it was something separate almost checking the we'll boxes. take care of the work you do the safety stuff and it's come a long way i, I have to admit it's you yeah. know we're still struggling in in t at times in places but i think we've made some progress yeah, we're starting to see a lot of companies are starting to, it's, it's really, instead of it being an add-on, like you're saying, it's more, it's interwoven into their operations and it's, it's, it's meshed together. It, it has to be. Um, it's, it's and they're starting to see that. Are, yeah. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, we're starting to see that. I mean, you still have some that just, you know, don't, don't get it. Um, but, uh, you know, until they get a fine or, mm -hmm. you know, something bad happens. Right. What, and, what industry has been the slowest to make that move? You see a lot of different industries and a lot of old school you know, like the oil and gas, I'm assuming maybe the old, the chemical business. I don't know. They really can't be left behind, frankly. Right. Uh, oil and gas, so they, they've, they've got, come a long way as far as the requirements, uh, and just things like Haswopper and, and your mm -hmm. basic safety, depending on what you're doing on site. There's also, yeah, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but there's, there's a rig pass class. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's, there's a class that a lot of the operators require everyone to go through. Okay. So that, they know that no matter which company's out there, which employees out there, you have at least this basic oh, safety. I like that. It's kind of an MSHA like thing. MSHA right. Is you get a card, respect. and I mean, a lot of operators will not let you on site unless okay. you have it. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I, w I wish that were true uh, in some of our industries. You know, the grain world, you know, we do a lot of food processing up here. We do a lot of grain up here. You know, some manufacturing, data centers, as you know, you're mm -hmm. kind of in the data center business construction, now, yep. construction, mm -hmm. a lot of those types of construction things. And other than maybe OSHA 10 hours or 30 hours, there's not a lot of consistency and uniformity in their yeah, approach. That's, right. And, and that's one of the things that I think the oil and gas, you know, sector has really pushed is they've, got, they've gotten together and said, okay, we're going to make sure everyone has at least the minimum. So mm -hmm. if, if you're somebody who's been in the industry for 30 years and been mm -hmm. through all kinds of training, or you're some 18 year old right at a, right at a high school, uh, you at least have this basic minimum training. I like that. And you know, we always try to make people understand as well as like, okay, you've, you've come to class, whether it's a day or a week, but it's when you walk out the door, it's, that's not the end of it. It's something you have to do on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And, uh, course there you know people have to work that into their operations and mm -hmm. their schedules things like that yeah i i'm really interested i i liked what you said about the uh, teaching element and having a background as an educator yep. with a science technical background and then moving over into the education of adult working people um the fact that they just don't sit and learn well yeah i it was very ironic to me because the you know the Kids, obviously, they don't always want to be in school, but if you, if you keep them engaged, mm -hmm. they're, they seem to, you know, enjoy it, even though they may not act like it sometimes, but adults mm -hmm. are actually the same way. Mm -hmm. When I got to thinking about myself, I'm like, I, you know, I want to sit there and just be bored to death by, you know, death by PowerPoint. Right. You know. Right. It's, so we, we try to make sure that we do a lot of hands-on and. I love that. Mix it up. I mean, too much of anything, I think, is, you know, you have to break it up a little mm -hmm. bit. I think that's really critical, and I think. That has been a huge mistake uh, throughout my uh, experience as a safety person, um, sitting in the classroom and trying to teach people off of that PowerPoint on the wall. These are people that 
either they work with their hands, they're outside, whether it be construction guys. I can remember in the beginning when I was with OSHA doing trainings or doing presentations to groups of construction workers or laborers from industry. And you bring them into the classroom and, you know, some of them sit like this and just give you that. <laughs> I'm not interested in anything you got to right. say, asshole. And some of them immediately, once they sit down, they're just, they, their head goes down because if they're not moving, they're yeah. sleeping. That's, those know. are the ones I pick on. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. But I think you've, you've hit on something that could be a separate discussion entirely, how to train people that work for a living. It's different than how you train people that sit in a cubicle for a living much different right i mean they're they're out of their element a lot of times because they're they're used to being outdoors moving not where everything comes to a standstill mm -hmm. and so just you know keeping them interested and in showing them the value and 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 not just you know doing the same thing year in and year out and, mm -hmm. and it's we do a lot of refresher training for people and it's always tough we're, we're always getting new material and trying to do new things so you don't have to do the you know exact same you know, scenario every year. And that, that is, that's tough. It requires a lot of work. I, I know that my clients, um, when I do training for clients and I mentioned to them, well, this is going to, you know, take X amount of time to do the preparation. Like, haven't you been, you've been doing the same thing for 35 years. What are you talking about preparation? Well, right. you can't do the same thing over and over and over again. It just pop a video in and you can't know, do that. That's it. I mean, that it has been done. Oh, it's been done. And I mean, I think, you know, there's, that's another thing when you're talking about training, there's different media, different, uh, you know, avenues where you can teach people. Mm -hmm. Obviously what a, my background in teaching is one thing it did teach me was that like, not everyone learns the same way. Right. So there's people, if you tell them something once they've got it, uh, there's people mm -hmm. like me, you, you verbally tell me it's in one ear and out the other. Right. I need to see it. But even more importantly, if I, if I see somebody do it, I learn, I learn better. But then when I actually do it myself, mm -hmm. so that's why we try to incorporate the you know, hands-on into a lot of what we do, because it just, it helps, you know, uh, one of the best examples I can give you, you've probably taught log, log uh, you know, the when we're talking about energy, mm -hmm. you've got lockout, tag out, mm -hmm. and you'll have people, whether they're doing it individually or, you know, as a group in class, they seem to get everything, but then you make them do it and they always mess something up. Absolutely. And it's, it's, and then they're like, wow, this is not as easy as it seemed in the classroom. And yeah, that, and that's an interesting comment too, man, because, um, you almost inevitably, invariably, you have to go out into the facility and put your hands on that stuff. Those disconnects or those, whatever, you know, those little devices that you use to maybe lock out a breaker or whatever that is. Right. It's not easy. I mean, as you said, it looks easy when you're sitting there in the classroom and somebody's pointing at a picture of some plastic shit from Brady or something that, you know, this goes over that. Okay, whatever. Yeah. Until you're out there and you actually put your hands on it and you try to verify that machine is de-energized or tested or something. It yeah. uh, it doesn't really work. Yeah, it's better to figure out that you're you're making a mistake ahead of time before it actually cost mm -hmm. you. So, no doubt. Yeah. So, so, um, you're still, you said you're still getting out in the field a little bit. I mean, it's, yeah. your time is probably stretched pretty thin. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, but the, between the, the growth with the offices and the acquisitions, it's, you know, that eats up a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And luckily I have a really solid team Good, and they're able to, you know, keep us moving forward. But I do get out in the field, you know, some. Good, man. But it's. Like you were saying earlier, it's it's always nice to meet people. It's all about relationships. It is it very very much so, and I, which is why I, I will enjoy this. And you know, I'm I'm sure we'll connect and talk yeah. in the future and stay in touch. I think that's, you know, I think the relationship part of it is really, um, you know, putting people together with who they need or what they need. You know, that is a skill in and of itself. You know, just identifying because people don't often know what they really need. They're asking for something. They don't really explain it very well necessarily, right. or they don't really know where their gaps are and helping them identify those things and putting them with the right people is actually yeah. an important part of this. I think also a lot of, a lot of companies, regardless of the industry you're in, you know, a lot of people have the approach like, well, you know, we're going to sell it to you cheaper or, you know, there's, they're trying to sell you something. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and what I've learned over the years, uh, one of the best things, if you put yourself in their shoes, um, one of the best things you can do is walk in. And if you're talking to somebody like, Instead of trying to tell them what you can do, ask them where they're struggling. Mm -hmm. And good for and, you, man. And sometimes they're struggling with something that we 
don't have any expertise in, but like you said, I, I know somebody right. and I can connect them. And I've, right. we've had that happen a lot where you put two other parties together and they're just, they're thankful. It's, you know, again, it's yes. all about relationships. Absolutely. That's fancy. So, so are you going to continue to grow? I mean, is that, yeah, I mean, what's the vision for going forward? Yeah, for that, that is our, that is our goal. We're always, you know, looking for acquisitions and, and opening you know offices and mm-hmm. key geographic locations. Um, Typically, like I said, we, we started out as an environmental company, so we're always looking at other environmental consulting mm-hmm. firms, mm-hmm. but also, uh, you know, safety companies and uh, industrial hygiene, mm-hmm. uh, even you know, surveying. We've looked at some surveying oh, yeah, type yeah. companies, architecture. Uh, there's there's always some overlap. So mm-hmm. Absolutely. it really just comes down to the, the geographic locale, uh, the industries that may be served there. And, and you know, there's companies out there that may have uh, – you know, only a little bit of overlap with what we do, but they have a very interesting client base. Mm-hmm. And so it's, you know, trying to go ahead and, and, and streamline that. And I, I was talking to our uh, chief operating officer last night, we were meeting with somebody and it's kind of, they were asking me a similar question. And I'm like, yeah, I go out and I, you know, identify mm-hmm. companies and you know, make the acquisitions. And then I hand it over to them and I'm like, okay, now you guys have to implement it. Mm-hmm. Thing. So, mm-hmm. um, but that would be a, that would be interesting, and and trying to identify, anticipate where those overlaps would be useful, you mm-hmm. know, because you might, as you said, a particular company might bring some expertise in an area that you're familiar with that your clients have already identified as a need, but maybe they do something else, and you know, trying to weave that together, I think, would be kind of enjoyable. Yeah, and I think you're you know what you're really talking about there is synergy. You're trying mm-hmm. to find synergies for people and. Um, you know, for clients and it's all about problem solving. That's what, mm-hmm. you, know, you said you've been to our website. I mm-hmm. always get people ask me, what do you do? And I'm like, well, you know, where do I start? <laughs> right. there's, there's so many, but yeah. um, I, I usually just tell them that, you know, we're, we're in the problem, uh, problem solving industry. Exactly. You know, that's really what you're trying to do for somebody. It's yeah. Uh, and most of these industries, whether it's, you know, agriculture or oil and gas, manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, whatever, they all have jobs to do. They're trying to focus on their business and then they have a lot of, you know, regulations that they have to comply with. Mm-hmm. Um, they're trying to yeah. take care of employees, but it's not their area of expertise. Mm-hmm. Right? It's so they're trying to find a, somebody who can really help them and not necessarily just use them as a, as a vendor, but uh, there a lot of companies are looking for a partner, someone mm-hmm. that's going to yes help them, you know, be with them and, and help them do the right thing and solve problems as they grow. Right. It's just kind of like peace of mind. They're looking for peace of mind to some degree through that relationship. And I I think that's a great description of it. Um, So I was down in Louisiana. I was with OSHA at the time. I was on kind of a response team for OSHA. So I'd been through Hazwopper training every year and they kind of kept us in the background. And then you know, after 9-11, they sent a bunch of OSHA folks out to New York to assist mm-hmm. with not rescue, but recovery and safely doing those operations. And then I spent about a month down in uh, Louisiana after Katrina. They sent a bunch of OSHA folks down there. We had actually been in New Orleans the year before that when they evacuated New Orleans, if you recall. Yeah, there, there was a safety show there that I that was year. there. I was at that safety show. Were you? And, and I. It took me 16 hours to get back to Shreveport. No because of, shit. Yeah, that's exactly that's crazy. what happened to me, man. Yep. So we at were at the down convention there center at the convention center mm-hmm. with a group of OSHA people and our regional administrator, Chuck Adkins at the time was down there and the mayor had come out and said, get you some Benjamins and get on the road or something to that effect. I don't yep. remember the exact word, but we rented a car like the last car available at the airport, <laughs> yep. rented a car, loaded into it. And started driving, and it took me took us thirty three hours to get yeah, back that, to Omaha. It was insane. New Orleans to Shreveport's normally about five hours, so we right. had to take back roads. <laughs> right. So and, you knew how to use the back roads? Yeah, you know, well, not very well because it, it took. It, I think it took us almost sixteen hours to get home. It was amazing because the traffic was just bumper to bumper. I mean, we were moving like you know a, a mile or two, you know, an hour in some places. It was remarkable. It was just you know, and then they finally opened up the interstates, and you know, yeah. But I can, we, you know, we, we slept in rest stops in the car. You know, you would basically shower in the sink at the rest stop with 20 of your closest <laughs> friends. And, yeah. and uh, oh, it was really an interesting thing. Um, but the following year was Katrina. Right. And so I got, 
uh, just mobilized as part of a task force to go down there. And I, I was in, um, we weren't in New Orleans. We were stationed maybe in uh, Baton Rouge or. Yeah, Baton Rouge is about an hour. But maybe Baton Rouge, perhaps I was assigned to like a FEMA task force, you mm-hmm. know. And so just doing safety and health support work for that. Um, I stayed. Actually, they dormed us in the uh, Louisiana School for the Visually Impaired. It was some old, old facility. It was like an old dorm room uh-huh. for children with vision problems. And so I'm sure they were learning, you know, to read Braille or those different things. And they just basically lumped us together with a bunch of people from the Corps of Engineers or FEMA, whatever. Um, but I spent a lot of time and it was really interesting. I, you know, normally I'd only been to New Orleans for conferences and for debauchery and stuff, you know, <laughs> and uh, I really enjoyed it. Really good people, uh, kind people. Yeah, they're very friendly. I, I enjoyed that experience. There was a lot of remediation, a lot of mold issues and concerns like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I was on a team that was uh, assigned to help try to get like hospitals back online to make sure that they were safe to reoccupy and use. It was, it was interesting. Yeah. We, we do a lot of uh, work with related to hurricanes and catastrophes and uh, a lot of remediation comp- We don't, mm-hmm. uh, we do soil and groundwater remediation, mm-hmm. but we don't do remediation of buildings. So like, mm-hmm. The restoration companies do right, um, but right. they usually have us, on, especially on large projects, go in ahead of them and map everything out and basically build them a, a you know a blueprint of mm-hmm. what needs to be done. And it, it's worked out really well because they're allow, you know it allows them to go ahead and focus on you know mobilizing their people, getting their equipment there, and you know, focusing on what their you know overall strategy is going to be. Uh, meanwhile, we're doing the assessment for them. Mm-hmm. And so by the time that they're ready to go, you know, we're turning over yeah. diagrams and telling them what can be dried, what needs to be removed, uh, right. where the asbestos is, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. That, that sort of thing. So, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, man, that, that, that is really interesting work. I did a little bit of that work previously with Terracon. It was kind of interesting. I'm not a, I, I was doing phase ones and phase <laughs> twos, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, but every now and then you'd go out on the drill rigs or we'd mm-hmm. go down and we had a bunch of sampling wells and monitoring wells and things around the city. So you'd go along with the environmental guys. I mean, as an industrial hygienist, I was usually just hanging pumps and stuff. Right. But I, it's really interesting work, man. Phase twos are actually, to me, is very interesting. Phase ones, I, I totally get where you're coming from. It's, it's kind of a sleeper. A little bit of a sleeper. It's but just you, like a literature search, is, for the most part, as I recall, isn't it? I mean, pretty much. I mean, you have to go on site, but it's you do find a lot of interesting historical mm-hmm. aspects to properties. And, you know, yeah. I know things were there and looking at property records, but you know, I'm, I'm not exactly super excited about going to the courthouse and looking through <laughs> property records. <It's, laughs> right. So... If you um, break out your work, are you guys like, so your offices, you have offices around the country now. Yeah, we do. Are they doing all of these things or do you have like an industrial? I mean, there probably aren't as many industrial hygiene people. So maybe you have an industrial hygienist that covers a region or how do you break your offices out? So we have, uh, I believe, 21 offices around around the country. Uh, Now, most of them do safety and industrial hygiene. Not all of them do environmental. Environmental is a little more specialized. It is, yeah. But um, we have the offices that do the environmental can support other offices. Mm-hmm. So it just it depends on the, you know, the situation. Sure. And our environmental side, we do a lot of work with the states. There's a lot of like trust funds that are set up for, you know, by state. Mm-hmm. That, um, they set money aside. Okay. And go ahead for remediation, things like that. And <clears throat> it allows us to... Uh, you know, we, we go ahead and bid on those, but, you know, every time we go ahead and pay for gas, you know, a few cents, depending on the state, a few of those cents are going to this trust fund mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. It, it, it's, you know, there's a lot of really good programs out there, mm, good. but as far as, you know, the, the other, I'd say most of the offices, we do a lot of safety, a lot of industrial hygiene, good. industrial hygiene has actually probably become the biggest part of our business in, nice. some, in some years, mm-hmm. depending on, mm-hmm. I mean, I know in 2020, we, I think there was five hurricanes that mm-hmm. hit the U S yeah. And so we were extremely busy. Um, in other years it's, you know, it's pretty even, but mm-hmm. just very good. Just depends. Mother nature has a lot to do with it. Good. We yeah. don't have a huge industrial hygiene presence here in Nebraska. 
you know, there are some, there are a few companies that have some industrial hygienists and I still do a little bit of industrial hygiene. I'm, I am an old man and I'll be honest with you, like getting up at four and getting into the plant and having all your pumps and dosimeters and stuff and hanging all that stuff. And then chasing these guys around the plant for 12 hours, checking on them all day is getting harder. You know, I used to love it and I still enjoy it, but it's, because yeah, it's, it's it's not it's not easy. No, it's it's a lot of work. I think it, people think, like you said, you just show up and yeah, uh, it's, there's a lot. You have to order the media and you have to make sure that you've got everything. And, and there's a lot of nuances to it. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's a lot of work that goes on before you even get there. I can remember, you know, I started with DOD and I was very fortunate because I had a a good safety manager that hired me, and then they had a senior hygienist that basically trained me. And then the Department of Defense has deep pockets, so they sent me to a lot of great training. I was going to NIOSH and mm-hmm. Ohio Bureau of Workers' Compensation and stuff, getting a lot of nice training. Um, but I can remember getting here um, work when I went to work for OSHA. And no disrespect intended. The, se- the senior hygienists were good friends of mine and were very nice to me. I, I, I'm in, still in touch with them, even though neither of them are still there. But... I can remember like going in to pre-calibrate my pumps and they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm pre-calibrating my pumps. Ah, yeah. We don't do that shit. I'm like, what? <clears throat> I mean, you know, I mean, it makes a difference. I mean, oh, absolutely. Uh, some of those legally, things, particularly, yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, if you ever end up in court and no doubt, like, you know, show us your calibration records. Yeah. And, and people are like, what? <laughs> and OSHA doesn't, I mean, OSHA does industrial hygiene work, obviously, but it's, very limited you know they they sample for a few standard metals and they might sample for some silica or something some very basic stuff and again i I know some really brilliant hygienists with osha but it's kind of limited and you know when i was with terracon you you were just like given problems and you had to just figure out Mm -hmm. how to sample it and so you work with your lab people and you try to come up with us come up with a way to we've had to do that as well there's been times where they're like we you have to come up with a method for yeah, it. Figure out the exi- me- exactly. Yet, yeah. But, uh, and a lot of people don't even know what industrial hygiene is. I know. I was at a, a event uh, last weekend and I was talking to this lady and uh, asked her what she did. She's like, I'm a hygienist. I'm like, Oh really? And we kept talking and I realized she was a dental. hygienist. Dental, that's right. Exactly. Which <laughs> I thought when I first started, like, you know, I'm going to be brushing people's teeth. Yeah. It's but like, I love the feel truthfully, man. And, um, like you, this wasn't really what I had envisioned when I was going through school and, you know, preparing myself to work. But as I've told many people, um, this has been a real a gift to me. You know, working in this profession has been rewarding. I've met great people. I've seen things that most people will never see, you know, just from a you know, getting into plants and stuff. Is it is it still exciting for you? Do you still I, enjoy yeah, it? I, I think it's exciting. It's it, when there's a problem, it's always fun to try to come up with a you know, innovative solution mm-hmm. to solve it. Yeah, uh, and, and you're, of course you're helping people, you're solving their problems. But it's you, you mentioned about you know always finding you know new things out there and, and seeing new things. And I would tell people every year I see something I've never seen before. Right. And I'm just like I can't I can't believe that. It's awesome, it's isn't just, it? Yeah, it's, it's I, interesting. I think that's well. So um. If you don't mind my asking, how'd you get to Louisiana, man? Is that a, something you can discuss or? Oh yeah, no. I, so I, I grew up in Canada and I, mm-hmm. I went to school um, in the U S my undergrad in Wisconsin, in Wisconsin. Oh shit. And nice. uh, <clears throat> which is almost Canada. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> kinda. Kinda. And then I ended up um, moving to Louisiana and, a, a, you know, for school. Okay. To work on a master's Okay. Degree. Gotcha. So, okay. so then I, that makes kinda, sense. I kind of gets, you know, got there and just ended up staying yeah <laughs> I, I have a good buddy uh steve jordan uh former osha guy who's from uh lake charles yep louisiana in 2020 that they got hit by two hurricanes they got hit back yeah, to back like hard. within 30 days i know man yeah. that was rough i think he still has people down there um which was you know really difficult but i've got a few clients even here that have locations in louisiana so i still get back there once in a while yeah. I have to be honest, man. I love the food. I was gonna say, great food. I love the food, and the yeah. people are really friendly, really nice. As long as you're not like a freak with blue hair or something, I suppose, or whatever. <laughs> necessarily, <laughs> oh, man. No disrespect intended to no, blue they're, hair. They're, yeah, the, you know. Overall, the people are, are very nice down there. I thought so yeah. too. I do remember. Um, I have a uh, uh, 
Plaquemine? Plaquemine Parish. Yes, I've got a, a client in Plaquemine, and when they they had a flood and there were um, alligators in the plant, I thought that's a little different. Yeah, you know, so snakes not and alligators. You see every day. I don't see that here very often. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, so that's a little different, but it is great, man, and um, I enjoy the trip. Yeah, it's it's a different world there. I mean, with the with the swamps and everything, it's mm-hmm. uh, you know, New Orleans, great city is very interesting yeah. historically there's it is there's a lot to do and like you said the food is amazing the food is amazing and it was a big conference destination so i went to new orleans many times uh for the safety conferences specifically that they have this glenn williamson forum thing at some of the national safety congress uh meetings where uh osha people present osha cases you mm-hmm. know you submit a you submit a case that you might think was interesting I can remember doing a, a presentation on this Glenn Williamson forum for one of my colleagues at OSHA who was unable to attend. And so my boss said, Hey, go down there and give her presentation. And it had been a meatpacking inspection. And so I, I made it a point to take a bunch of really gory pictures from the packing houses and stick them in there just kind of to be a, you know, <laughs> and um, shock and awe. It's just a little shock and awe. And I can remember, <laughs> this room full of people who many of whom had never been apparently um, in a packing house and flipping up the pictures. And you could just see about 80% of the heads just go down. Yeah. And I'm like, this is our world. You know, this is, this is a real thing. I'm not. Yeah. People don't necessarily want to face it, but sometimes you have to show that and it's, it, it makes it, them very uncomfortable, yeah, but it was probably more, it probably makes them think twice. Maybe so. Yeah. Yeah. This was actually, you know, OSHA here, we do a lot of grain and we did a lot of uh, packing houses. And so when you would take that new person for the first time to a kill floor, to a packing house, you would kind of, it was almost like an initiation of sorts, you know, mm-hmm. you would kind of see what you had. Yeah. Some of them uh, left immediately and went to work, <laughs> you know, at a telemarketing this place. Is not for me. Yeah, they knew immediately because I know that when I left OSHA at the end of 2013 was my last year with the agency. I swore to myself three things. I'm never going to wear khakis again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to go into a packing house again. And the third one probably can't be uttered on, yeah. on this pr- program. But I have had to wear khakis a few times. And some of my best clients are packing houses. So, And the third one I didn't follow up on either. But, you know, I thought. Yeah, I've, I've been in some plants that... Uh... I mean, I, I went I think, a year and a half without ever eating, eating chicken because <laughs> I, I was at a, I was at a facility and it just, it smelled so bad. And uh, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, it, t- it can it, do that. It to was, you, man. it was rough. It can do that yeah. to you. Well, I, you know, one of my clients here is the big chicken facility up in Fremont, um, Lincoln poultry, mm-hmm. and they are the producer of the rotisserie chickens for Costco. Oh, okay. I don't know if you've ever eaten a Costco yeah. rotisserie chicken, That's- but they are awesome. They, they get that's how they get, they hook you they get you in there with the chicken mm-hmm. yeah I think, I think costco that's their leading uh loss they, they lose money on the chicken oh, they, they lose money they on, make the chicken, money on they, everything else and yeah. then when you walk out with eight eight hundred dollars worth yeah. of stuff in your cart because it smells so good in and there. a five dollar mm-hmm. chicken or you know a slice of pizza the size of this table for a dollar <laughs> that food uh is the draw and then you walk out inevitably with a thousand dollars worth of merchandise that you probably didn't even want but yeah, it's kind of like Whole Foods. You go in there and like sometimes people go there for lunch and it's like. Yeah, it's a $20 lunch yeah. to get a salad, but. Mm-hmm. And then you get a bunch of other stuff. Right. You end up walking That's out cool. with way more than you. What do you, have, you didn't know you needed. Do you have a favorite industry? Do you have an industry that you have really grown attached to? Is that. Uh, I, I, I think the, the, the whole, uh, you know, insurance restoration side mm-hmm. of things is always interesting to us because we go into areas you know after a hurricane and, and it's just devastated the people mm-hmm. are you know their families are are not able to be in their homes sometimes mm-hmm. um their place of employment is shut down because there's either no power or it's been damaged the kids can't get in the school mm-hmm. and so it's it's always you know very interesting but it it's it's a great feeling to be able to you know help get it those is. people back I'll to bet. you know daily normal life yeah that's really cool so, man. so th- that's you know f- from a you know it's overall i'd say that you know the restoration is, is pretty interesting to us but um i've always liked working in oil and gas 
That's an interesting industry as well. And I don't have much experience in oil and gas. That's We have ethanol up here. So I have a lot of ethanol clients. But oil and gas was kind of a Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas. Thing. You know, it was really not a Nebraska, not a big Nebraska thing. Right. And now it's, you know, they they found that because of the shale plays, there's, it's kind of opened up in other areas. Mm-hmm. Um, that is interesting. You know, from an industrial hygiene standpoint, we've all, we do a lot of work for defense contractors. So mm-hmm. that, that's always interesting. an interesting, you know, facilities to go to. Yes, I'll bet. Yeah, very good, man. It, I, I'm, I'm excited for you. I'm welcome to Nebraska. It'll be yeah. good to have you in, in uh, the area. Yeah, we, we, we enjoy being up here. It's nice. a great place to come, to come visit. It, <laughs> that's, a, that's how I describe a lot of places. <laughs> they are great places to visit. Are you excited to get home? Is it warm, warm back in uh, Shreveport? Yeah, it was, it's, you know, it's, it, it is a little warmer than here, but mm-hmm. um, people are always surprised, uh, especially my family in Canada, they come down, they're surprised in you know, December, January, how cold it actually gets there. And it's the humidity that's there in the summer is there in the winter. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like, it feels damp kind of, yeah, or, it's like kind of like a, bone, it is a different kind of cold. cold. Yes, yeah. it is. Uh-huh. I, I can it surprises appreciate people. that. They're like, I thought this was like Louisiana. I came here for the sun and the warmth. I'm like, uh, it's or coming, <laughs> but just yeah. not this week. And then it's in the summer. It's the opposite. You feel like you walk outside, you feel like you're breathing water. Yeah. You know, the humidity is just mm-hmm. miserable. So. We, we get quite a bit of humidity here, but not, not quite like that, but yeah. it can be pretty humid in Nebraska along the river. If you live here, on the east side if you drive three or four hours west it's dry and it becomes almost arid like uh eastern colorado that you know that low desert kind of it gets pretty dry but man right along the river and i live by the river and it is humid in the summer man so yep it's which is cool i i'm really enjoying this conversation so i don't want to wrap it up so no it's fine what about um hobbies and stuff man tell me a little bit about your life outside of anything that you're willing to share right that's not intended to be nosy oh, no, but no. Uh, what kind of stuff do you like to what do you do in louisiana uh so do you have I mean, time to do anything yes yeah, some a little bit <laughs> I, I do travel a <laughs> I was lot say, I was, so yeah i'm, on, I'm, on, ton of free I'm on i'm on the road a lot mm-hmm. but you know louisiana is kind of a, a very interesting place i mean there's a lot of outdoor activities mm-hmm. and you know uh, enjoy fishing yeah, don't, I get do to do it, don't get to do it a lot. But, I, know, I don't uh, either. Yeah. I do too. And uh, coming from Canada, what is the fishing like in Louisiana? I mean, Canada is a, a fishing mecca in my experience. Oh, yeah. We used to go it's, up to Ketico, you know, mm-hmm. Ketico Park, uh, that provincial park up in Canada. Yeah, this the it's like night and day when you the fishing. It's uh, so Louisiana, there's, you know, a, a fish lot. for gar or something. Down there. Well, or catfish. Catfish, you know, yeah. And, and, yeah. It's interesting because they're they're kind of bottom feeders mm-hmm. and you try to catch them and half the time you don't know if you're hooked on a rock or you actually have one <laughs> and it's, right, it just right. it dove to the bottom exactly uh, so yeah it's it's fun it's a good way to pass the time yeah it uh, is I I like going to you know sporting events and mm-hmm. oh there's a lot of that that's a lot of fun yeah. if you're up in Omaha sometime around this area over the summer we'll go catfishing up on the Elkhorn River we used to just oh really okay we'd go up there and we'd put out like lines up and down the river and then we'd just drink beer and sleep on the sand and you hear, <laughs> you hear like three in the morning you hear the little bell mm-hmm. you know and you go down there and you'll have a 50 foot you know flathead catfish or 50 50 pound yeah. not 50 foot um, yeah I was but it's kind of a fun experience man I was very surprised when you know when I moved to Louisiana when they told me how big some of the catfish are I'm like no way and Mm-hmm. they do have some big scary you'll, you'll, creatures you get a workout trying to haul one of those things in yeah yeah, yeah but that is cool and i know there's a lot of hunting in louisiana yep a lot of hunting Other guys down there hunt that i've worked with before duck hunting is really big down there is louisiana it? and arkansas yeah very cool yeah. I, I mean i haven't been but i know a lot of people that go like, that they they live for that yeah I, there are a lot of those guys around here too a lot, of, yeah. a lot of people, you know, take on plants on. They are gone, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, you better, you know, the plants usually shut down out west. Well, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because uh, one of our slowest times of the year for training is right around October, November, because the, <laughs> the, the business owners are like, there's no way I, I'm going to have a ride on my hands. If right. I send these guys to Haswopper training or safety training. During, During hunting, hunting season. season. I yeah, totally agree. I have yeah. the same issue. Is it, I'll, yeah, I'll lose half out. my staff. Exactly. Mm-hmm. This is out. This is out. We actually shut the plant down for a week over opening day or whenever, you know, yeah. when bird season yeah. or deer season starts. Well, 
Yeah, I'm, right. I was talking to the guys is. yesterday. I'm, I'm, I'd like to come up here maybe for the College World Series too. That's always that's fun. I usually always watch it. That's so. a great event, mm -hmm. and LSU is usually in it. <laughs> yeah, they usually are. They're usually in yeah. it. That would be fun, man. Well, yeah. absolutely. I we go. My wife, my wife loves uh, sporting activity. She loves to go to the events, and so we, you know, Creighton, uh, the university here in town, mm -hmm. is in the Sweet Sixteen. They're actually playing tonight. Yep. Uh, they play Princeton. Which might be interesting, yeah. You know, Princeton, I think was a 15 seed, 15, and they are surprises. Beat, they've beaten some good teams. So, but we go to Creighton basketball games. She likes to go down to Nebraska football games. We'll go to the College World Series, uh, and it's, I mean Fort Omaha. Those are those are fun events. You know, those are fun things. So you should come up for the World that would, Series. That would be fun. That'd be cool. It, it has been a pleasure, man. I have Thank to, you for having me. I, uh, I was, I've been looking forward to it. We've been trying to connect. I know that we've had some difficulty. You're busy, and I am don't answer my phone, so that okay. makes it difficult to connect, but I've enjoyed it. Um, I think this is going to be great for the people here in Nebraska to have a, another consultant that can do all of these things, provide all these services. That's wonderful. So yeah, it's, it's always fun. Like you said, it's about relationships, meeting people, and helping is. them solve problems. So. Yeah, very good. I look forward to it. So. Safe trip back to uh, Louisiana. You're heading back today? Yeah, I'm going to head back. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> well, the good news is Epley Air, Air, Airfield, you can get through security in eight minutes. Yeah, it's kind of like Shreveport. Is like, it? There's like two gates. It's Maybe perfect, three. man. Yeah. It's so, perfect. I like it. Yeah. Have a great weekend. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for having nice me. Nice to meet you. Yep. Thanks, guys. Everybody have a great weekend. Um, keep doing what you're doing. It's important work, and we'll talk to you next week. Later.